Good morning, everyone. It's so good to see you all, especially all of you who worked the craft fair yesterday. I'm absolutely astounded by all of you wonderful, wonderful, tremendous people who worked so hard toward our craft fair. We over... I, we prayed last week that God would bless our craft fair. Well, he blessed us mightily. We got a little over $3,400. Yeah. And that's all because of you who participated and made all of those wonderful things, all the jams and jellies and cakes and breads and everything. I'm, I'm over the moon with everything, and I, my, my heart is so filled I'm, I can't even begin to tell you how happy I am. This is just unbelievable. Calvin's going to t tell us a little bit about his, his uh, vacation. Not long, though, but a little. Yeah. Hello. Hello. Well, he, he'll bring those next week. Yeah, unfortunately. Um, oh. Unmuting the wrong, wrong me. Um, yeah, so I, I just got back from, turn it down, okay, turn it down. Um, I just got back from a, a little trip. I um, took a plane across the pond, and I, I got to see my girlfriend and in the school that she's going to out in uh, Switzerland. Uh, She's going to get her master's in marketing and fine art and luxury in a, a school uh, right next to Milan. And so it, it's a, a really, really old town, it, city. It, it started to be uh, settled in in the 1200s. So just old, old monks uh, were, were settling there and there were just the most... Um, beautiful old churches and old brick brick uh, streets and everything was just super yeah super old and stone and uh, absolutely gorgeous it was right on uh, Lake Lugano um, and yeah so it, it was really nice to get to see her we got rained on the entire time uh, but you know uh, rain never seems to dull my days so it was uh, it was super fun and but now I'm glad to be back and glad to, glad to see all your smiling faces. And yeah, happy Sunday, everybody. Thank you. He'll, he'll bring us some pictures next time, you know, of the rain and things like that. So <laughs> we'll get to see that. No, no, not at all. Here, here are some pictures of the craft fair ladies. They were in my dining room and working. They, I mean, they really were working very hard on putting all the packages and putting ribbons and bows on all the things that you brought. Next slide. And, and this was a, sort of our setup that we had, or this was our setup that we were doing for the craft fair. Next slide. And those were all your fabulous baking goods. Isn't that amazing? Oh, look at that. Next. Yeah, and, and the stars, and th they went like that. I mean, I'm not kidding you. It was fabulous. We only have two stars left, so you better grab them while you can, while the grabbing is good. Okay, that's it. All right, thank you so much, Marcia. Yeah, so we have two birthdays, uh, Lois Zerby and Carol Fields. Carol, both of them were on the first of the month, so let's sing happy birthday anyway. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, number babies. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. <laughs> okay, y'all should be up here because you all are bad. <laughs> it's real, it is funny. <laughs> so, oh gosh. Okay, so there there were no anniversaries. Actually, there's no anniversaries for this month, but Sunday the twelfth. Don't forget to bring your shoebox, and if you do it online, would you please email uh, Lois and let her know so that she can keep track of how many boxes <laughs> that are being done online? And what's you know that what was really great is that uh, Bruce and I have Thrivent, and so he applied for a grant for from Thrivent for the shoebox, and we each got a $250 grant, so that goes towards the shoebox, so that'll buy 20 boxes. So that, that's another 20, 
which is really great. So we're really excited about that. Uh, Monday is Coed Bible Study. We're in Season 2, Session 5. I finally said it right. We have several sign-ups outside that are really, really important. Um, you know, we have a lot of the same ushers and greeters that have been doing this for a very long time. And I think we'd like to get some, they would like to retire a little bit and maybe get some new blood into being usher and greeter. While we're in this room, you don't really have very far, you know, it's just we only need two, you know, to pass out the elements and to collect um, the money. So that's pretty much all, all that we need. Doesn't take much of your time to do that. You fold up the bulletins, you know, and get those ready to be passed out. So it's it's a really simple job to do. If you're if it, it's upon your heart to do that, please sign up. There's a, a sign up sheet outside on the table. And then we have the a ladies' luncheon, our normal ladies' luncheon, uh, at, at the end of November. Uh, please sign up for that. And we're going to do what's called the story jar. And this is always so much fun. Um, the way we used to do it until Ellen told us how we should do it. Um, so we're going to be doing it Ellen's way. <laughs> so uh, you, you pull two little things out of the jar, and, it, and it, it asks you a question, and then you answer the question. And it's in regards to your life and that kind of thing. It's really, it's funny and fun. So please sign up for that. And, uh, and then the most important thing is our Christmas dinner. It's December the 3rd. And the reason I'm doing this now in November is because we don't have a lot of time to sign up for these things. So there are four selections of food categories out there. There is uh, a gluten-free and also a, uh, what's the other thing? Be a, well, I, don't, I guess it's that, yeah. So anyway, there's addition things, additional uh, items that are on the menu. And thank you, Marge, and thank you, Mary, for picking out our, our dinner that, that we're going to be having. And so those are out there. So please sign up for that. It's always so much fun. We always have great entertainment. So I encourage you to do that. And that's one of the times we all get together and sit, talk, and have a good time. And then to end the whole winter, or Christmas event, we have our ladies' Christmas party at Kathy Bound. Ladies, you don't want to miss that one. That is so much fun. You will have, you will have an extraordinarily good time, right, Ellen? Always, yes. And yeah. <laughs> okay. So that that one is October the uh, the eleventh. I'm so, yes, I'm at December the 11th. Thank you so much. And it's on a Monday, so please, please sign up for that. And also, we need flowers for November. Okay. Does anybody have anything? What is it? Say what again? Uh, oh, thank you. I, I would have sent that email out. Yeah, next Sunday we are going to be in the Antero room because they're having a party in this room and a party in the Humboldt room. So they're having two parties. And flowers this Sunday was given by Bernadette II in, in memory of her sisters. Yeah. Bernadette II, the, Bridgewater II. Yeah, she's Bernadette too. Yeah, so, all right. Anything else? Yeah.
morning, oh, a little bit, okay. Good morning, everybody. I have a little story to tell you, but I first I have to ask you a question. How many of you know the name of the man who on Good Friday went up to Pontius Pilate and asked him for the body of Jesus? How many of you know who that was? Not very many. What? Yes, thank you, Joyce. Joseph, and the, the name is pronounced so many different ways. When I was a little girl in Catholic school, um, we called it Arimathea, but I don't know if that's the right pronunciation or not. Anyway, it was a little town near Judea. That was kind of brave of Joseph to go up to Pilate and ask him. Um, he was going to put him in his own tomb, and Pilate said, Joseph, I have a question for you. Your wish is granted, but my question is, um, you are a wealthy man, and you bought that tomb for you and your family. Why would you give it to Jesus of Nazareth? And Joseph looked at him, and he said, well, it's only for the weekend. <laughs> is that good? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, a friend of mine told me that, and I thought, I love it. <laughs> okay, I, I have this short little prayer for us today. Father, it's not always easy to give you thanks in all circumstances like we're told to do, but I offer my gratitude to you right now, knowing how you've worked things out to bless not only me but others in the past, and trusting that you always will. Amen. Our first song today is Freely, Freely. And uh, join us. I think the verse is about. Okay. God forgive my sin in Jesus' name. I've been born again in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, I come to you to share his love as he told me to. He said, That was a JD joke. That was really good. <laughs> Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Father, we humbly bow before you this morning. You created all things, and all of creation is under your authority. You provide for us the food that we eat, 
the air that we breathe, the incredible sunrises, especially the one this morning, the very blood that flows through our veins. You have made it all, and all things are yours. You created us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. Everything that we have and everything we are, we owe to you. We thank you, Father, for a successful craft fair. We lift up to you and honor all the worker bees who worked so tirelessly and gave 110% of their time, talents, and energy. We give thanks to all the bakers and jelly makers who made so many special items. We are grateful and honor them this morning. Father, we have come before you this morning with heavy hearts. Those that we have named silently before you, both on our lips and in our hearts. We lay them before your throne of grace. We raise our prayers to you for those who are sick. We pray for healing, comfort, and grace. We pray for our church that we may be faithful to you. We pray for our community <clears throat> that they may come to know you as Lord. We pray for our nation that we would turn from our sin <clears throat> pardon me, and worship your holy name. We pray for ourselves that we would love you more and share your faith with others. Father, in your mercy, hear our prayers for your people, and we all say, Amen. I'm going to be reading from First Chronicles 21, verses 1 through 2. Satan rose up against Israel and cited David to take a census of Israel. So David said to Job and the commanders of the troops, Go and count the Israelites from Bathsheba to Dan. Then report back to me so that I may know how many there are. This is the word of the Lord. Sorry, guys. This is Luke. Okay, I'm going to read from Luke now, 14, <laughs> 31 to 33. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000. If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off, and will he ask for terms of peace? In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, our, am I back on? Yeah, our second worship hymn today is one that Calvin and I introduced oh, a couple months ago called I Have Decided to Follow Jesus.
doxology now, and this is where we stand. pray for the offering. Jesus, we're grateful. How can we repay you? You didn't ask for 100% of what we have. You simply asked for a portion. And Paul said, what we've agreed upon in our hearts with you, will you use that to expand your ministry here at Heritage Eagle Bend? And as we head into the holidays, Um, that we would be mindful that more and more people are aware of their need for you as the season grows. So bless these offerings for the expansion of your kingdom. In Christ's name, amen.
All right, let's pray and then we'll study God's word. Holy Spirit, will you guide us? Will you give us insights that we didn't have before? Ultimately, will you let us see who you are? And may you be glorified in this time. In Christ's name, amen. I was talking to Larry. He said he had some allergies and they cleaned the carpets and the ductwork and the upholstery. And <laughs> we shared stories of coughing fits with that stuff when your eyes water and then all of a sudden it just, it goes. So I have a throat lozenge in my mouth in case you hear it rattling around. It's not something loose in my brain. I know some of you thought that. Um, we looked at this passage, First Chronicles 21, a few weeks ago for a different reason. Um, let me just read it again. Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So David said to Joab and the commanders, go out and count the Israelites from Beersheba to Dan and then report back to me so I may know how many there are. And we looked at how uh, at, on that occasion, um, how Satan influences our minds. He lies to us. He deceives us. He creates fear and move David to do that, and we have to be on our guard. Um, if you put these two passages together, the other one in Luke 14 about um, a king going to go off to war and how he calculates how many he has, and can he win the war? You go, well, one of them is done by Satan, and then Jesus is talking about the other like it's a good thing. So what do you do with these? So here's a couple levels for you. One, I want you to Let's take a step in how to understand and read our Bible. But two, we're going to understand these passages and how they seem to be saying the same thing, but it's uniquely different. So here's three things I want you to get. The first one is if you read Scripture and it seems to contradict, you don't need to put it on Facebook. Hey, these, these verses don't make sense. God's confused. That's not the case. We in the West, in the Western Hemisphere, were very uncomfortable with tension. Disney, amongst other things they've done, they've done us a disservice because everything ends with the hero getting the girl, the villain getting justice of some sort, locked up, put in a lamp, whatever. <laughs> and we put a nice bow on it. And because I grew up going to Sunday night church, it always had to happen Right before we went to church, we watch Animal Kingdom, Mutual of Omaha. See, Merlin knows what I'm talking about. And, and then there would be something Disney, and they would have to wrap it up. Then we could rush to church that night, and we could all feel at peace. That's not real life. John 16, 33, Jesus said, you will have trouble. In the Greek, guess what trouble means? Trouble. You're good. All right, good. I'm just seeing if you're awake. When you read scripture that creates tension, it's okay. You don't need to defend God. When you see things that happen in the world, you don't need to defend God. What do you say to people? Well, why would God let this happen? You know, this is why I'm a Christian, because I don't even understand everything that's going on in the world, but I do have a need for a savior and grace because I'm not a perfect person. And I trust that God hasn't fallen off the throne and he knows what's going on. Well, why does he allow evil to exist? He allows it in hopes that people would come to the knowledge of him and, and come to Jesus. But there will come a time when that will cease to exist. His patience will turn into his judgment. And mercy will no longer be available. This is how we answer these things. So first, when you're reading the scripture, if there's tension, don't panic. Be sober-minded. Just wait on the Lord. Well, what about my reading plan? I've got to stay on task. The heck with your reading plan. Stay with that passage. Let the Lord speak to you. Second is this. Let's not be deceived that we are to live without tension. That was the first point about tension. But now, you're not, you're not guaranteed when you come to Jesus an entitled, comfort-free, smooth journey. If somebody preached that to you, we need to have a conversation because you got the wrong gospel. Look at Jesus, it cost him his life. Look at the disciples, it cost him their lives. 
We've got to change how we frame things. I talked to so many Christians, and now they're starting to mix in. I've said this before, they mix in. Well, the universe wants me to be successful and happy and rich and healthy. The universe doesn't give a rip because the universe cares about that as much as the speaker over there. It's inanimate. But the God who created the universe cares very much for you. But just so we're square, you're not entitled to a comfort-free life. I'm sorry, to a comfortable life that is pain-free. Now, I'm looking up on the faces of people here who are nodding and say, yeah, I got that part down. Just be careful of some present-day teachers that are still trying to convince us that that is what Jesus is bringing you, comfort. One day in heaven, yes, forever, he will wipe away every tear, and then no disease. Yeah, great. Resurrection bodies are all in shape. They don't creak when we go up and down stairs. If there are those in heaven, perfect. But for now, all of creation groans, including your back when you stand up and sit down, right? Then the third point is this. Remember two weeks ago we talked about this, the absolute key to being faithful to Jesus in the long term is perseverance and endurance because it is not easy. And I will tell you, we will see many in the church say, oh, it's too hard to follow Jesus. I'm too scared to give testimony. It might cost me my life. I, 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 I give up, Jesus. I'll turn back. I'm not a follower of Jesus. I'll, I'll, I'll worship whoever you want me to worship. Don't do that. I'm telling you, don't do that. And the times are growing closer that we may have to stand for our faith and die for our faith. Am I trying to scare you? No. I want to root you in. And I have this conversation with my kids all the time. Someone will be like, oh, that's, that's scary parenting. Well, I think it's good parenting. Now, here's something about David. It happens in 1 Chronicles 21 and 2 Samuel 11. It's a little clue. We look for these clues, and if, if you haven't come to Bible study on Monday night, I want to invite you because we tease out these clues a lot. Here's what the Scripture says. 1 Chronicles 21.1, 2 Samuel 11.1, both talking about David. In the spring, in times when kings go off to war, and then it starts the story, and here's what you find. David is not off at war. David's in the palace. This gives us a clue that trouble is coming. Trouble's coming. 1 Chronicles 21, what he does is he sends Joab, despite Joab trying to talk him out of it, take a census of of how many soldiers we have. Now, why is this wrong in that context? Because it doesn't matter how many are there. Wait, what do you mean? Because over in Luke 14, Jesus says a a good king will count his soldiers. Okay, different situation. David is supposed to trust in the Lord. Do you remember Gideon? How the Lord divided him up, some lap like dogs and some scoop it up with their hands, and, and he wanted to successfully reduce the size of the army so they would know it was the Lord who gave him victory. Same with David. He doesn't need to know. David, it doesn't matter how many soldiers you have, just go to war. The Lord is with you. The Lord has called you to do this. Now, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for me? How do we live out? Am am I about to go to war? No. Well, we may be, but you know, you probably won't be drafted. I'll just be honest with you. Um, (laughs) But what about the spiritual war? What about it? Lord, you want me to pray what? You want me to give what? What? Well, wait, let me, let me go see if I have enough money to do what you're asking me to do. It doesn't matter. Because if he needs to bring more, he'll bring more. Well, Lord, I don't have time because I... If he needs to make the sun stand still so you can have an extra hour to do that, can he do it? Yes, he can. So for David, it's wrong for him to go. David is trying to grow towards independence from God. God. It's a bad place to be. In the time when kings go off to war, David is supposed to be someplace else, but he's sitting around here in the palace going, eh, I wonder how great our army is. 
sitting around thinking about how great we are instead of how faithful God is. David grows to a point here where it's kind of a, a casual relationship with Jesus. Well, the Holy Spirit, pre-incarnate Jesus, yeah, with God. It kind of becomes casual. Now, why is this, why is this concerning? Why, why does it happen? Why do we drift? Because it doesn't just happen with him. It happens with me. It happens with you, doesn't it? We get busy doing something. We get focused on something. Do you wonder why the Lord allows hardships to come? To jolt us awake. Do you know why James 1.5 says, ask for wisdom when you're facing trials? Because we will realize, oh, you know what? I was drifting from the Lord until he brought this difficulty, and then I have to throw myself on his mercy, and I have to shake myself awake spiritually. That's why he says you can be grateful when difficulties come because it doesn't let us drift and become casual with the Lord. This is the only way I know how to say this, and, and the Lord has been impressing this upon me the past couple of weeks. There is a sin of exactness or quantifying things that David does right there and that we do. What does that look like? Well, Lord, I've given that much. That should be enough. Well, Lord, I gave you 15 minutes. How much more do you want? Hey, Calvin, if, if when you went overseas to see your girlfriend... If you said, hey, I've hugged you twice today, <clears throat> I've kissed you once, we've had five minutes of conversation, isn't that enough till tomorrow? No. Is he still going to be in a relationship the next day? How about no? <laughs> and yet, with the Lord, we go, well, I gave you an hour on Sunday. I did a shoebox. I gave a little money. I gave you 15 minutes that I read the other day. I listened to a sermon. Where did this all start? You really want to know? Give you a little history lesson? It started with something called modernity. What happened then? It's called the scientific method where they wanted to measure everything. And all of a sudden, God, who was the center of culture, got pushed to the outside because he said, if we can't see it or prove it, it doesn't exist. And they started calculating everything. And they, you can't calculate God. How can you calculate the love relationship? Paul writes this. How high, how wide, how deep is the love of God? Who can fathom it? Do you remember the scene on, I think it was on Oprah? When Tom Cruise jumps up on the couch for one of his many relationships. One of his many Ladies, he was crazy about. I'm so in love. And then we watch, and it, it drifts. And then they're on to other people. And that's, not, that's, just, that's just human nature and whatever, and not commitment. I don't know what it is. But in the moment, everybody goes, oh, you're crazy. But he didn't care because he was in love or something. Do you understand that we can't calculate how much love? We, we like to be very efficient and go, let me just do enough. Let me pay just enough taxes. Stay out of jail, in trouble. Let me drive just slow enough so I don't get pulled over. But I'm going to push it. Let me leave just enough time so I can squeeze in there at the right time. But I'm definitely not going to be 15 minutes early. We do this, but we, let's not do it with God. He didn't do it with us. Oh, they only nailed one hand to the cross, and, and the rest they didn't, so that's enough for you. Or I gave, I, I forgave 30% of your sin. You're good. See, he doesn't play like that. He, I think it's First John says, he lavishes us. Does God love us more than we deserve? Oh, yes. Does he forgive us, and forgive us and give us mercy more than we deserve? Yes. So why can't we do that to others? Well, no, I forgave him once. You remember Peter? <laughs> uh, let, me, let me get in good with Jesus. Seven times, Lord? 
If I forgive him seven times, am I doing good? Jesus said, actually, you're way short, Pete. How about 70 times seven? He's like, oh my goodness. Do you see the kingdom perspective of God? It knows no bounds. You can't reduce it to a few numbers. It's not transactional. The depth of his love for us, the depth of his mercy and forgiveness for us. See, David is trying to become independent of God in this situation, and maybe he's not in his right mind spiritually, so he starts to calculate, can we win the battle? Do we have enough people? Baloney, it didn't matter. If God says, go and I'll give you victory, you got victory. If God says, pray this, call that person, whatever, can you trust him? Is he trustable? Then the other passage. Suppose a king's about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and calculate and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming with 20,000? If he's not able, he send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. Isn't that what David's doing? But here's, here's Jesus' application. It's a, this one is about counting the cost. It's a value proposition. Will, it, will this work out? Because here's what Jesus says at the end of verse 33. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. See, people want to say, Jesus, oh, he's all inclusive. Jesus can be exclusive. But it takes humility to come to Jesus. We can't come arrogantly. Well, I'm coming... I'm giving God some time. He is holy God. You come the way he says you come, or you should not come at all. Come humbly. We are beggars asking for bread, asking for forgiveness. And if we move on from that place, we might be like David beginning to get casual, taking God for granted. In the same way, any of you does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. His point here is count the cost of what it will cost you to pursue me in a love, sacrificial relationship. That's what Jesus is talking about. And I want to tell you, I listen to a lot of sermons. I have people say, hey, have you heard this, heard this? I want to tell you that is a sermon that is not being preached in America. 2 Timothy says, in the end times, they will gather around them teachers who will tell them what they want to hear because their itching ears just want to be scratched with, oh, you're so good, you're so wonderful, you don't need it, you don't need to repent, baloney. Jesus loves you just the way you are. Well, he does love you just the way you are, but he doesn't want to leave you there because the way you and I are put him on the cross. He wants to move us on towards maturity. So count the cost of what it means to follow Jesus. Paul would talk about shipwrecks, beatings, sleepless night, cold, hungry. And for some dumb reason, the apostle Paul thought it was all worth it. We can get up in the morning to go fishing, to play golf, to go work out, to go to the grocery, to travel, to run errands. Can we get up early? Can we stay up late to seek the Lord? Because like with Calvin's girlfriend, a couple of hugs there, 15 minutes, that's not what it's about. When you're madly in love with someone, and how can we not for what the Savior has done for us? When we're madly in love with him, there's never enough time to spend with him, to walk with him, to express our love while we're driving, while we're walking, to talk with him. That's prayer. It's not sitting Indian style in the corner like this with our hands folded in our head. Come on. Just talk with him every day. We sing the song and he walks with me, and he talks with me. And you know what he told me? He told me that I am his 
own. And the joy we share as we tarried there, none other has ever known. That's, that's the traction on the road of life that happens when we're not sitting here together. You and Jesus, me and Jesus. And when we get back together, you know what happens? Those experiences come in and there is something miraculous that happens when people that live with Jesus like that get together and start to talk about what the Lord is doing and their love for the Lord. That's living in community. That's awesome. That is awesome. Is it worth all this to follow Jesus? David was a man after God's own heartbeat. He had his moments of in the spring when it was time to go off to war, a census and an affair. How about us? Are you ticking the boxes, get, just giving God enough to try to stay out of trouble? It doesn't work like that. Let's pray. Father, when we slow down long enough to think about all that you give us, all that you protect us from that we don't even know, that you say in Hebrews 1.14, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to those who and serve those who will inherit salvation. For, for us? You send angels to serve us? You died on the cross for us. You give grace to us. You prepare a home for us. You lavish love on us. How can we not live different, Lord? Holy Spirit, would you anchor these truths into our souls and our lives and our minds and our hearts? Let them not fade into a, a lunch and an afternoon. Rivet them into us. It's in the name of Christ I pray. Amen. And we'll recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty. As we prepare our hearts now to receive communion, we will sing, Let Us Break Bread Together.
come to a time at the table. You know, my daughter's 21. She's a junior in college. She's, she said this the past couple of times she's called. She goes, I'm sorry that I call you and, and, and have to talk about this stuff and, and try to figure it out. And I said, I'm not. I'm absolutely not. And I keep reminding her, I said, you know, the, the conversations that you're having with your dad at 21 are different than the other 21-year-old conversations. I know beyond the shadow of that because I used to work with 20-somethings, launched a 20-somethings ministry. The Lord had me do it over at Cherry Hills when I worked there. I know what they think about. And I'm grateful that she thinks a little bit beyond what they think about. But I never, I'm telling you, I don't. I don't get tired of her calling and saying, hey, Dad, what do you think about this? Hey, Dad, could you read my paper? Hey, could you help me think through this? And I'm a decent dad. But our Heavenly Father is a phenomenal Father. And when we come to Him and we say, Dad, I messed up. Dad had said this. Dad had did this. Dad had went there. Dad had, Dad had been home on this a long time. It's like, why are you carrying that? That's heavy stuff. You're not made to carry that. I am. I'm your Father in heaven. That's why I said, my yoke is easy. Bring it here. So today as we come to the table, leave it here, whatever it is. Heavy stuff. But he's a loving father who, who loves for us to come. We never exhaust him. We don't need to be embarrassed. Father, what can we say in response to who you are to us? your open arms to each person. And if somebody doesn't have that perspective, Lord, that you could even right now in this moment heal that and change it like only you can do. As we come to the table, may we just sink into your arms and experience your love. And we'll pray what Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven.
before we go our separate ways today, we'll sing our last song, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. Judging by the looks on your faces, the Lord's been at work here today. You know, those two passages, I didn't know the Lord would do what he did today here, but each time is an experience with him. So um, in the kingdom, he's called us to live a lifestyle of lavish love, both with him and with one another. So that's our benediction today. Live a kingdom lifestyle and lavish love both with the Lord and with others. Be blessed.